Hello and welcome back. It's my great pleasure to be here with Swami Shankarananda again for another installment of our question and answer series. And today we'll be talking about his recently released spiritual memoir, Ganesh Puri Days. If during the course of our conversation you have questions that you would like to write into Swamiji, you can write them in in the comment box below and we'll try and get to them. If you enjoy this online program and you'd like to get more involved with the ashram online, you can visit us on the web at www.satsanglive.com.au. Welcome, Swamiji. Hello, Maharaj. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you again. It's so nice to be here. So today we're talking about your recently released memoir, Ganesh Puri Days. And the book was so incredible to read. It's really a, what I consider a love letter to the guru-disciple relationship. Did you have any concerns about writing such a book in an age where the guru-disciple relationship was under such scrutiny, or where we talk so much in, in the spirit, modern spiritual movement about being self-empowered or self-directed? Look, I'm aware that uh, in uh, modern spiritual circles, uh, they say things like, uh, the age of the guru is over, and so on. I couldn't disagree more. Mm. For me, the one factor in, in my spiritual development was meeting a Satguru or true guru and doing sadhana or practice with that guru. So I value uh, the guru highly. Uh, and if you read scriptures, uh, it's like that for thousands of years. I don't think we can say in this new age uh, uh, that no longer applies. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, something in the Western, modern Western psyche. Uh, it could be called the three-letter word E-G-O, ego. Um, but it seems to me that if you want to learn something, a very good way to start that is by going to somebody uh, who knows about it. Mm. And if you say, well, I read scriptures, so on, where do you think scriptures came from? Scriptures came from great realizers. So in some way or other, human beings hold this kind of knowledge and we have to learn it from human beings. When I found out uh, from Ramdas in 1970 that great realizers, great beings, enlightened beings uh, exist even in modern times, I wanted to go find one and be at their feet. Mm. That's the first thing I wanted because I had become very confused by life and very frustrated and I wanted to to start to grow and to understand things more deeply. So I said someone who who's attained that goal would be able to instruct me. So I didn't have that point of view. Mm. So um, I think it's a, a wrong point of view, but uh, it reflects something in our age. Mm. Now, a memoir is a very specific kind of literary style that can mean lots of different things to lots of different people. Yeah. and. Uh, an interesting thing I think about yoga is that everything is much is as much what it is as what it's not. So like it's not enough to just be attracted to good things, you have to be unattracted to bad things. Yeah, and right. in the same way, when you look at memoir, a memoir is as much what you put in it as what you leave out. And so I was wondering, were there special considerations that you took when writing your spiritual memoir? For instance, a lot of the more controversial political aspects of the Siddha Yoga lineage have been left out of the book. Where, how did you find balance between being a spiritual teacher and a storyteller? <laughs> a very good question. Um, a memoir is different from an autobiography. Mm. In autobiography, you tell the whole story. A memoir is specific and pointed. Uh, and my goal in this memoir was to celebrate my guru, Baba Mukhananda, mm who is the greatest being that I ever met and who transmitted so much to me and I learned so much at his feet. Um, and to also celebrate the, the process of sadhana, which is spiritual uh, development practice. Mm. And also uh, uh, to celebrate discipleship. 
and the, the guru-disciple relationship. Uh, so I had those goals, and to celebrate um, the shakti, or the spiritual energy, that, that, is, uh, that the guru is the repository of. See, the guru is not just some fellow who has a lot of uh, book learning or something. Uh, he actually is in touch with a higher energy. Mm. And we call that shakti, which means divine power. Uh, and he has the ability to awaken that same energy and transmit that same energy to people. And that was my experience when I when I got to Baba, is an awakening took place. And I was not alone. There were thousands that he awakened mm. in that way. And so um, uh, so that's the, the true nature of the Guru. So I wanted to celebrate the existence of this hidden but sacred power, the Shakti, the Kundalini Shakti, mm. uh, and um, and also that the, that the Shakti should dance in the book. When I first read Baba's spiritual autobiography, Play of Consciousness, uh, I could barely read a page. There was so much Shakti I would pass into a trance. Mm. And I would love if my book had that kind of, well, any kind of Shakti. That, that, that's the purpose. So the purpose is not to uh, be a a uh, tell-all book or, uh, or a his even a history, it's to convey the Shakti. Mm. When I give a, a spiritual program, I talk about the self, the guru, uh, practice, and so on. The goal is to transmit that Shakti. Mm. So that's the goal of the book. Yeah, I definitely feel like the overall tone of the book, it carries this energy of upliftment that we call the Shakti. And even in the moments where... Yeah, it's great to hear. Yeah, <laughs> even, even in the moments where... It, feels heartbreaking like when Baba when Baba passes away like that there's still this energy of upliftment that's even uh, pregnant in those moments of sorrow yeah, yeah. it's it's beautiful well, thank you <laughs> and uh, on your way to meeting Baba Muktananda you met a lot of the spiritual heavy hitters of that age in India <laughs> and you can really see that um, the spiritual quest is this process of unfoldment can you talk about maybe meeting some of those kind of giants of spirituality in India? And what, what made you leave their company and ultimately stay with Baba? That's a very good question. Because uh, before I met Baba, um, I met uh, Ananda Maima, mm -hmm. great woman saint, highest level. Uh, Nim Crowley Baba was a great saint. Uh, I studied with Haridas Baba, a great yogi. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a number of others. No, Go, uh, Sri Goenka. I did uh, Vipassana with Goenka, the founder of uh, the Vipassana movement. Mm. Um, and each of them had uh, their own qualities some gr and greatness, qualities of greatness. Uh, but in each case, there was something that I didn't click with. I think it's fate. I think that it's fated that, that Baba was my guru. Mm. I think your guru is is faded, without getting too romantic about it. Um, uh, the, and so, see, for example, let's take the case of Nim Karoli Baba. Mm -hmm. I met him, I spent a bit of time with him. I loved him. I thought he was uh, in an exalted state. I had great joy being around him. But when my head was at, this is what my mind told me. You see, I think it was also happening that, hey, you're not with him, you're with Baba Muktananda, but I didn't know that. Right. But um, what my head was telling me is, well, this guy is wonderful, but what can he give me? Uh, I need to learn some yogic techniques. Mm. And he didn't do that. He just sort of hung out with you, gave darshan, and then there was a little chanting, a little chai. And that was it. Yeah. I said, I want to learn to, I mean, look, I'm from an academic background. Right. A, B, C, I want to know how to do this thing. Yeah. Uh, and he wasn't going to do that. So later, when I understood that the guru-disciple process is essentially osmosis, transmission, um, then I understood that just hanging around with somebody like him could, be, could do it. Right. But I didn't know that then, so I moved on from him. Yeah. And then, uh, in each case, it was something like that. I could have stayed, but I didn't. Mm. And uh, when I got to Baba, it was like, yes. Especially when I saw his ashram, which was so powerful and so on purpose. Mm. 
Mm. I saw this is ideal. And then I saw that Baba himself had, had given himself to helping others make that connection and to grow. Uh, and so it was just very impressive, and he was so impressive. Mm. In, in Ganesh Puri days, you talk about there being that kind of surface level of the ashram, which is the, was the ashram daily schedule, but underneath it, you remark that you felt it as a mystery school. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about what that is and why that was yeah. such a big selling point for you? <laughs> Well, because I had, uh, you know, early in my, uh, in the late 60s, I became interested in spirituality. Mm. That's, that's a whole story. But, but um, one of the first uh, sources that I read was Gurdjieff's teachings. And Ospensky, uh, who wrote a beautiful book called uh, In Search of the Miraculous, mm. um, was a Russian philosopher and mathematician. And he got the spiritual bug back around the turn of the 20th century. And he decided that there were mystery schools. Mm. Even, even that term is great, mystery school. It means uh, a school in which a different kind of teaching went on, a different kind of educating went on. Not conventional academic education, but mystical, spiritual education. Mm. And it was mysterious. And these were hidden, these mystery schools in his mind. And he even went to India and Sri Lanka looking for them, couldn't find them. Eventually, he met Gurdjieff, who came to well, St. Petersburg, I think, mm. uh, came to him. The mountain came to Muhammad. Uh, but um, uh, so I had that notion that mystery schools, wouldn't it be great to find a mystery school where the ancient truths are transmitted? And I imagined everyone tiptoeing around in uh, like secret places, whispering and in their little caves, meditating, and the master walking among them. I had this image. But Baba Zashram wasn't like that at all. It was filled with people and joy and exuberance and noise. It was crazy. But behind it, if you had the eyes to see it, it was this mysterious process going on. Mm. The Shakti was dancing there. So it was a mystery school in plain view. You could easily miss it, <laughs> but that's what it was. One of the things I love about Ganesh Puri days is that we get a direct glimpse of your inner process of being involved in this mystery school. And at the heart of it is you kind of untangling yourself from ways that you're contracted or ways that you suffer. And um, you call it frying in the book. <laughs> and so if you just want to share with the people at home, like what when you talk about frying, what is frying? And is this kind of suffering necessary on the spiritual path? Like, do we have to fry? <laughs> no, no, of course not. Don't do that. <laughs> Alas, yes. Uh, I, I think frying is what happens when the ego meets the shakti. Mm. When the spiritual energy starts to meet the ego and there's a fry that takes place because a lot of your preconceptions and your habits and your rigidity has to be melted down, as it were. Now, frying is a metaphor, right. but it seemed like a very good metaphor. And we all, living in Baba's ashram, there was a small group of uh, seekers from all over the world living there, and we spoke that line. We said, oh, I'm frying. What that meant is I'm out of touch with the Shakti. Mm. I'm not in harmony. I'm burning in some way. I'm full of anger. I'm full of fear. I'm full of depression, something. And it, I'm burning through it, and then you then you emerge from that, and you feel that upliftment again, and then something else comes up, you might go back into a fry, but gradually as you as you master the process, the fries are shorter, mm. and you know what to do about them. Uh, but the fries all come from ignorance, uh, from from that, and it's what Gurdjieff used to call uh, intentional suffering. Mm. He said, everyone in life suffers. Everyone. Nim Karoli Baba said, uh, he used to sit there saying, tool, tool, non, non, tool, tool, non, non, which meant too much, too little. He says, everybody's living in a world that's too much or too little. Right. Too much bad stuff, too little good stuff. <laughs> and we burn in that. So yeah. we, we fry in that. That's the normal condition of life. Too much, too little. 
too much virus, you know, not enough uh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the mind seems to continually pull us in between those two poles. Too much, too little. As, as you were in the ashram. But, but Gurdjieff said, just to finish that thought, Yeah, <clears throat> Gurdjieff said that intentional suffering is different. Mm. That's when you subject yourself to a spiritual discipline. And that's suffering in a sense because you're not indulging yourself and running around. Mm. And out of that, something good comes. Real growth happens. Right. So the, the fry that we had in the ashram was intentional suffering. Mm. It was worthwhile. At least I felt it was. Yeah, it's, you could really so. tell the rigor of your sadhana. The sadhana that was happening in the ashram was really a crucible. Like every part of you was just being melted down. Yeah. All the ideas that you had about yourself and your life had to go. Yeah. But there but it was also a lot of fun. Yeah. And hanging out with Baba was a great thing. There was a lot of joy and upliftment too. And fry. How were you able to build such a strong relationship with Baba when on paper his cultural and social conditioning was so, so different? I mean, could you paint a picture for us of what was Baba like and how were you able to relate? And we couldn't even speak the same language. Right. But it's still a love story. You know? I, I can't explain it. Uh, he was so full of love. Mm. Uh, so full of joy. And so funny, too. Uh, the, and the energy was so great. Uh, it's hard to explain. Um, it was just a marvelous, uh, marvelous time. Not that you always felt in perfect sync with him. You would burn about that. That was a real burn. Right. Uh, Bob was not approving of me. And then, then my own uh, neuroses would come up and I would imagine and conjure all kinds of things and have to struggle with my inner demons. Most of my time in the, the years I was in the ashram was struggling with my inner demons, my caring thoughts, mm. and trying to come to some acceptance of myself. I like to think of them as my inner New Yorker. <laughs> it's not my inner demon, it's my inner New Yorker. <laughs> yes, well... Very little difference. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. as you... All as, my uncles and aunts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, as you hang out with Baba and as your relationship yeah. to the yoga starts to really blossom, yeah. you get a real sense that um, as you are engaged in these question and answer sessions with Baba, as you confront the turnings of your own mind, each answer you get from Baba or each insight you have is its own kind of initiation into the deeper mystery of yoga. And you're, we see you really progress from one age of your sadhana to the next. Can you talk about how when you're living in close proximity with a guru, how everything is this kind of little initiation where something's given and something's taken away? <clears throat> well, it's like that. It's a, it's a highly intense. Uh, and Bobby talk about the play of Chitti. Mm -hmm. which is like you could see consciousness uh, uh, sparkling. And the ashram was a very special atmosphere where everything had, was filled with meaning and transformation. Uh, so it was a bit, it was a, a bit like that. And uh, every word that he said, you know, he answered my questions, uh, they mostly were extremely transformative and useful to me. Uh, sometimes I would leave a question-answer session uh, shattered in some way. Mm. Had to go have a cup of chai and calm myself down. And any answer to somebody else, I would take it personally. <laughs> and I'd say to myself, that wasn't for you, that's for him. Uh, so it was very intense, but it was worthwhile. And of course, you don't know where you are while you're doing it. Mm. Uh, but then... Later, you're in other situations and you see how much you've gained, how much, how much easier things are for you. But it's a great, it's a, it's a, a great process. And I recommend it for everyone, at least a little bit. I went in whole hog. You really but, did. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but to spend a little time with a great being is a, is a marvelously uh, productive transformational thing. And because you were committed to it so fully, you, you really, you immersed yourself in a whole other world so, so fully. At any point in that process, were you, were you ever thinking about your future? There's, there's a bit of the book where you begin to study astrology and it seems like that might be something you can do. It turns out to be a huge, 
a huge fry, and and then ultimately. Yeah. yeah. I I um during those years, see, I, my career was already in place. Mm. Um, uh, as an academic, as a English, in English literature, and I already had a good job teaching uh, literature, and um, uh, but I was deeply dissatisfied. Mm. And so when I got there, uh, I settled into this thing, I'm just here. And I was really seeking the knowledge of the self, self-realization, enlightenment. Mm. Although I didn't think like that, but I, I said, I want to, you know, and I figured the next thing would happen. I, I really, even though I was a striver most of my life, I wasn't thinking that way Right. for some reason. I just was there. And I thought when the next thing happens when it happens. I mean, when I got to India, things happened magically. You know, I ran, went to this person, that person. I got introduced this way, that way. Everything happened. So I felt like some bigger power was controlling it. And at the right time, the, the one time you mentioned that I did think about the future was with astrology. I got grabbed, and I write about it in the book, mm. I got grabbed by astrology. Uh, you know, I, I was always cynical about astrology as a Western intellectual, but somehow I got grabbed by it there, and I started studying it and doing charts, and and then I'm doing it, and it, it fit my nature, my uh, kind of the chess player in me, the mathematician. And I thought I could do this. This could be future career. You know, it's spiritual, right. and it's kind of scientific also, and you know, it's mathematical and. And uh, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe. And then Baba comes up to me one day and he says, uh, Shankar, you're a Jyotish, you're an astrologer? I said, gee, gee, Baba, yes, Baba. He says, get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I did. I just gave it up. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was getting obsessed by it, I guess. And then so I, I had no idea uh, what the future held. And it all just sort of came to me. There, there's a wonderful chapter in the book where your parents come to visit the ashram. Mm -hmm. And when be, being confronted with you know, the possibility that there could be conflict between you and your father, Baba gives you some, yeah. some wonderful advice on yeah. how to keep relationships yeah. in a clear space. Uh, um, it was a great time. They, they came in early 1972. Uh, some other parents of some ashramites were coming, mm -hmm. and my parents used to travel to Europe every uh, summer. My father was an artist, my mother was a teacher. And I said, come to India, because I hadn't seen you in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. See what we do, and you know, and they thought, oh, okay. And they came out, and as, as the time came to receive them, I got more and more worried about my father. Because my father and I, I loved my father, he loved me, but, we, we were um, uh, always sort of at war intellectually. Mm. And um, I was afraid that he wouldn't get uh, the, the beauty, the spirituality of India. And said he'd see India, the poverty, all that. So the night before we were going into Bombay to pick them up, I ran up to Baba and I said, Pa. I'm worried about my father because I'm, I'm afraid he'll only see the poverty in India and not the spiritual greatness. And Baba said to me, agree with him. And uh, that blew my mind because I never agreed with him about anything. I suddenly saw that, that I had never agreed with him about anything. It's a bitter pill to swallow. <laughs> That's to have yeah, to agree. That, <laughs> and that uh, I was always trying to correct him and, you know, bring him into the modern age or something. <laughs> He's a very unusual person. But, uh, so, but it gave me a, a, a kind of a bliss. And so when, when I picked him up, I, had, I was laughing to myself. I'm going to agree with him. This is really interesting. And so we, we get on the train. We're going up, uh, you know, in Mumbai. You know, we're going towards the ashram. And he looks out the window, and uh, there's all these... Uh, slums, you know, like sh uh, shacks made of cardboard where they live, you know. 
And he looks at, oh my God, he says, look at the poverty. And normally I would have said, oh, come on, Pop, you know, you know, I'd argue about it. And so this time I said, oh, Pop, you have no idea. There's so much poverty here. It's grinding poverty. You haven't seen anything yet. And he looks at me and he looks out and he goes, but you know, there's a beautiful feeling here. <laughs> Really just what happened. Yeah. I thought, wow, nice work, Baba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I learned a really important lesson there. Mm. <clears throat> At the heart of Baba Mukjananda's own sadhana was his incredible surrender to his own guru and him kind of losing himself in his love for Bhagavan Nityananda, yeah. which he calls Guru Bhav. Can you talk a bit about um, the practice and your own experience of Guru Bhav? Yeah, Baba, uh, Baba explained that. Um, in his case, see, Baba was an accomplished yogi. Uh, and he had devotees coming. He's a vibrant young man. Uh, he studied everything, uh, all the yogic arts, Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, met many saints. Mm -hmm. uh, he was studying Ayurveda, all kinds of things. <clears throat> but he felt there was a piece missing. And then he didn't know what it was. And then he went and had darshan of Bhagavan Nityananda. And Bhagavan Nityananda gave him Shaktipat. And Baba's consciousness exploded and he saw Brahman, you know, like that cosmic experience. And it blew his mind uh, because... Um, he didn't know that that was part of the path because it's very esoteric. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so then after that, he he made Bhagwan Nityananda the core of his sadhana, and then he began to meditate on him, and he understood this transmission that happens, and by opening himself to Bhagwan Nityananda. He's not opening himself personally to the person Bhagavan Nityananda, but to that energy. And so that was the practice that Baba wrote about in his book, and, and uh, I practice. Mm. I opened to, uh, to Baba, the Shakti of Baba, and it worked very, very well. Uh, the knowledge mm. and everything else is transmitted subtly mm. and um, mysteriously. So that's Guru Bhav. <laughs> Wonderful, and as you, as as your relationship with Baba continues to blossom, could you talk about um, how being with Baba changed when you started to go on tour with him in America? Yes, the uh, uh, we the ashram was uh, you know maybe a uh, hundred people. I don't know. Mm. Anyway, at, during question and answers, we used to be able to fit in his room. So, and then it got too big and we would meet in the courtyard, but uh, it, it never got too, that big. A lot of people come on weekends. Mm. Uh, but uh, in the 1974, he went on his second world tour, and after that it got immense. Uh, and uh, in short order, it was a big operation with, with thousands of people there and programs and big intensives and uh, it was completely uh, a whole different thing. We were we were just in one place doing our sadhana, working on ourselves, doing the mantra, doing the chanting, doing the meditation, doing the ashram work. And now it was a, a lot of uh, service mm. and doing different jobs around, you know, running housing and the kitchen and, and catering to people. It was completely different, yet the shakti was the same. And um, by that time, Baba had, had the, well, after a short time on the tour, Baba sent me away to start an ashram. Mm. So I would come in from time to time to, to see the tour. And to me, it was delightful because Baba's teaching was marvelously noble and compassionate. When we were with him in the, in the fry pan, as it were, he would be saying, work harder, um, you know, work, work on yourself more, get over your bad qualities, do more mantra, do more meditation. 
you know, like that, and read Fry. But uh, in, the, in the big programs in the West, he'd say, you are the self, you are consciousness. And I'd say, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I felt very happy about it. And it was, it was that life of service that you started to lead, especially once Baba was on world tour, that led to such a kind of extraordinary life extraordinary life and the i mean the end of ganesh Puri days is just is incredible i won't spoil it for you but the the art of memoir is so reflective if i was wondering if hindsight ta has taught you anything about your experience or if you could if you could talk to that young shankar <laughs> from what you know now is there anything that you'd want to say to him oh yeah <laughs> I'd say enjoy the ride. Don't worry. The worry is not essential. Mm. Just enjoy your time with Baba and just meet every day the same and don't think about attainment or anything like that. And if you have some bad thoughts or tearing thoughts, they don't matter. Just keep going. Mm. It's, it's, it's fine. And, the un that the universe is essentially benevolent. And even without meeting a guru, the universe means well for everyone. And that what we need to get comes to us. And uh, it's leading us home, as it were. I profoundly believe that. Everyone is being led to self-knowledge and to, uh, to the right place. Mm. We don't trust it. We don't believe it. We think there's a big conspiracy and uh, some uh, strange group, the Illuminati, are running the universe and, and uh, making us all crazy. But no, it's God is running the universe and he's full of uh, compassion and full of wisdom and he's going to get us home. It's we who don't cooperate with him. Mm -hmm. So it's good to come into a little more harmony with that large process, that large energy. But I would tell Shankar and say, it's okay, it's going to be all right. <laughs> Do your practice and uh, enjoy it, enjoy it. Mm. You had the, you had the opportunity to spend all that time with such a great being as Baba Mukhananda, you know, the legendary Kundalini Yogi, the self-realized master. Enjoy it. Mm. Talk to him more. <laughs> <laughs> I was so scared of him half the time that I couldn't say anything. I said, but now I think I, well, I don't know. If I saw him, I might get scared. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I think I could say, hey, hey, Baba, what about this? <laughs> it's, I mean, that that's beautiful wisdom that I, I hope we can all take to heart a bit more <laughs> after after hearing that. Yeah, uh, live with faith. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> well, I think that's all the time we have for today, okay. Swamiji. Uh, Great questions. I just wanted to remind the viewers at home, if you'd like to um, learn more about Kashmir Shaivism or tune into Satsang or any of our weekly programs, they're all streaming online at www.satsanglive.com.au. Thank you, Swamiji. And the book's available now. Yes, the book is available worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. So read the book and let me and tell me what you think about it. <laughs> so. Did you follow me?